On today's podcast, we're discussing a topic that many people have experienced at one time or another, joint pain. As we age, it seems joint pains become more common. Is it an unavoidable part of getting older? Or can proactive measures help slow the hands of time as it relates to joint pain? Our guest today will answer those questions and more. Dr. Kwame Ennen is a board-certified orthopedist on the medical staff of Texas Health Plano. He specializes in hip and knee replacements, reconstructive surgery, and osteoarthritis care. That's coming up next. Welcome to the Wellbeing DFW podcast. Each week, Scott Sams will cover a different topic on improving health and well-being in our North Texas communities. He will host interviews with physicians on the medical staff of Texas Health Hospitals. Hello, I'm Scott Sams. Thanks for joining us today. We all know the routine. You get out of bed in the morning and that's when it hits you. A sore knee or a hip pain of some sort. But are these nagging issues just a given when we get older? Our guest today is here to talk about that. Dr. Kwame Inan is a board certified orthopedic surgeon on the medical staff at Texas Health Plano who specializes in hip and knee replacements, reconstructive surgery, and osteoarthritis care. We'll discuss joint pain and what can be done to reduce or even eliminate the problem. Dr. Ennett, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Doctor, it's a common topic among most groups of adults. Joints can really hurt. Let's start with why. Why do so many older adults have joints that just hurt? Well, the issue is this. It's about demographics. As we age, we accumulate life experiences, both just with living, but also on our joints. In our joints, those experiences over time is what we call arthritis. The accumulation of degeneration, sometimes traumatic events that lead to the joint no longer mechanically being the same joint that it was when you were, let's say, 15 or 20. That's what arthritis is. What causes the joint pain? Is it the result of an injury or just something that happens when we get older? So some of this is just the accumulation of life. You know, you, you wear out your tires, you wear out your joints. Traumatic events, an injury, a fall, a fracture, those things exacerbate arthritis. So we, we take someone who, let's say, would have developed arthritis in their sixth decade in life and they have a fracture. Now they have arthritis that is symptomatic in their fourth decade. It's that kind of thing. What role does activity play in joint pain? Is a physically active person more prone to joint pain than someone who has more of an idle lifestyle? So that's really a controversial question, actually, in orthopedics. The truth is, is that most very, very active people over their lifetime are prone to developing arthritis just because they're more prone to injury and they've used their joint more. They've put more miles on those tires, so to speak. Um, however, being sedentary and not being physically active is also associated with having uh, obesity, and obesity is also associated with osteoarthritis. So it's, that's a tough question to answer. Does having joint pain automatically mean that you're going to have to have a replacement of something? Absolutely not. Hip and knee replacement are reserved when conservative means of managing the symptoms associated with hip or knee arthritis are no longer working. And so there's a lot to do before you get to the point of, of deciding to do surgery. Interesting. Uh, what are some non-surgical solutions for someone who has joint pain? Well, there are lots of easy things. So if you, let's say, have hip arthritis or knee arthritis, something as simple as getting a cane can offload the joint such that it's not going to change the arthritis, but it may make it such that it's less symptomatic. Mm, that's good. I understand that exercise and even sometimes weight loss are recommended for joint pain, and, and that kind of makes sense to me. How do you recommend patients be active if their joints are already hurting? So there's, there's lots of different strategies by which to be active while at the same time minimizing the stress and strain on your joints. The first thing to realize is that the joints are machines that actually multiply the forces that the, the muscles can exert. And so the same way your body weight, they're multiples of that that your joints experience. So depending on what you're doing for your knees, hypothetically speaking, uh, your knees experience four to six times your body weight. So if you lose about 10 pounds, what your knees experience is really losing about 40 to 60 pounds. Yeah. For hips, it can be anywhere from three to about 11 times. And so losing weight can, can have a significant impact on what your joints experience. Now let's say you unfortunately already have symptomatic arthritis. How do you stay active? Well, there are activities by which you can get great cardiovascular workouts without putting significant stress and strain on the joints. Things like swimming or 
water aerobics, or riding a bicycle. Riding a bicycle can give you a significant and strenuous cardiovascular workout without putting significant stress or strain on the joints. And it's something that I recommend often. Doctor, what do you say to your patients when they come into you and they say, I have hip arthritis, what do I do? What, what do I do? Well, the first thing I do is I ask them some questions. One of the things and skills that we learn in our training is how to listen. And we learn a lot about medicine. But I think that where we lose some focus sometimes is on the listening piece. And oftentimes your patients will tell you exactly what's wrong with them and what you need to do to fix it. So when someone comes in and hypothetically speaking, they have hip arthritis. Well, I'll say, well, tell me about putting on your shoes and socks. And oftentimes if they have significant hip arthritis pain, they'll say, shoes and socks, that's the worst part of my day. I can't get my sock on. I can't get my shoe on. I can't tie my shoe. I can't shave my legs. All of those things are indicative of the fact that um, when they say hip pain, they're specifically talking about hip arthritis pain. The other things that patients sometimes say that they have hip pain, but they don't say those things. And that's a key, that this is not truly coming from the hip joint. And that's the difference. Mm -hmm. That's good. Sometimes as well, patients will say, you know, I have this pain in my groin, this ache in my groin, and I don't know what that is. I think maybe I have a hernia or I pulled my groin. Well, that's another key. It says, hmm, I got to pay attention to this hip a little bit more closely. Oftentimes, patients will complain of deep buttock pain or pain in their anterior thigh or knee. In fact, it's not uncommon that patients will come in and say, doc, I have pain kind of in my thigh and my knee. And really, the issue is their hip. They don't complain of the other issues. And so it really takes a keen ear. And you also know what, need to know what you're looking for when you're just listening to a patient before you ever get an x-ray as to what issues um, may be bringing them to see you. Doctor, for patients who have knee or hip arthritis, what are some of the ways non-surgically to manage their symptoms? Well, the most effective non-operative managements for hip or knee arthritis include anti-inflammatories, sometimes rest, activity modification, the utilization of assistive device, be it a cane or a walker, injections into said joint. And some of those injections can be steroid type medications, potent anti-inflammatories. Specifically for knees, we utilize medications that function as a lubricant. The fancy kind of scientific name for it is hyaluronic acid. And we inject it into the knees and, and it lubricates the knees and in, in doing so decreases the inflammation. And so there's lots of different strategies that we utilize to manage the symptoms associated with arthritis um, as best we can. And when we fail, that's when surgery is an option. Aches and pains come with getting older. I can tell you that from experience, but sometimes we'll shake it off. Sometimes we need to see someone like you come in to see you. Are there any resources to help people determine when they should consider seeing you, doctor? As it pertains to how to evaluate oneself when they have joint pain, what do you do with it? Number one, if the pain is persistent, see a doctor. Number two, there are some online tools by which to take surveys, answer questions, and to kind of get some rank ordering as to what your next step should be. Yourjointhealth.com is one such tool. If you go to this website, you take the survey, it'll give you some information as to whether or not you should see someone. Doctor, how important is it to see a joint replacement specialist, even if you're trying to avoid or delay having any kind of joint replacement? Well, I think that, and this is, of course, I'm biased, I think it's always good to see your joint replacement specialist. And I think that one of the ways to think about a joint replacement specialist is as your arthritis doctor or one in the team of arthritis doctors that you have. The reason being is that my preference is to actually catch patients before they're ready for surgery. The reason being is that one of the really great things about my job is that I get to form relationships with my patients. I get to understand where they're coming from, what their goals are, and doing so in one visit where the next step is surgery is sometimes a little bit challenging. So taking the time to go through the non-operative piece of managing the symptoms associated with hip or knee arthritis is useful for me as a physician to better understand my patient's needs so that I can better deliver on their, their needs. It also gives me an opportunity to educate them as to what they're going through, what to expect, and so on and so forth. I think that surgery, of course, is really where the magic happens, but the relationship building with managing arthritis pain uh, non-operatively is also a very useful tool in the healing. Doctor, how is the program at Texas Health Plano different from other hospitals? We here at Texas Health Plano capitalize on over 40 years of experience, as well as using the most current research and best techniques to deliver to our patients the best care that we can. 
Doctor, tell me about stem cells. Stem cells, that's a topic that I talk about frequently within my clinic. Um, oftentimes, it's with patients who are particularly terrified of surgery. Now, stem cells are sexy. They sound great. However, the literature does not support many of the claims that those who market stem cell injections claim. So you'll read in the paper, full page ad, come get your stem cell injection, restorative medicine to your joint. Your really arthritic joint will go back to looking like it was when you were 20. Um, unfortunately, that is not possible. The truth is, is that oftentimes the, the best literature compares stem cell injections to some other injections that we give and stem cells do not give superior relief. So the cost effectiveness of stem cell injections is very, very poor. Stem cell injections are oftentimes not covered by insurance, which means that my patients are shelling out anywhere from $1,500 to about $5,000 for these injections. So this is incredibly lucrative for those practitioners of these injections. I have a clinic that is full of patients with arthritis, and I never do stem cell injections. The reason being is that I think that given what we know and given how they're currently being implemented, that it's ethically dubious to give an injection that I know will not provide significant or long-lasting relief. So the long and short of it is this. If you're a patient that has failed all other means of conservative therapy, a stem cell injection is likely not going to provide you with significant relief. The best bet, the most cost-effective bet, is quite honestly to have your joint replaced. Tell me about the technology of replacements these days. Lots has gone on over the years, and fortunately for me, I am uh, a young surgeon, and I've, I've gotten a, the opportunity to learn from my predecessor's mistakes, um, both in implant design and implant utilization. And so some of the things from a technology perspective that have improved over the years is that we found better ways to get the implants to stick to your bone. In, in years past, oftentimes we used a special type of bone cement, and we still do, um, depending on the circumstance. However, we've had leaps and bounds uh, in our ability to get the implants to connect to your bone without using cement. It's a, a process called press fit technique, whereby the implants are pressed into a cavity that we create in your bone that's ever so slightly smaller than the actual implant, and it makes for a very tight fit. Now, the materials that we're press fitting into the bone are prepared in such a way, um, be it that they're chemically coated with things that are very favorable to bone growth, or they're textured in a way that mimics the texture of bone, so bone actually grows onto them, um, such that they, they almost, in a way, are being incorporated into your, into your bony skeleton. Um, and so that's a means by which we can improve the longevity as to how strongly the implants are connected to your bone. We've also improved the wear characteristics, so how quickly these devices wear out. Um, we've done that by utilizing different materials, specifically as it pertains to hips. We've begun to use ceramics in a way that we hadn't in many, many years in the past. Ceramics were things that we were concerned about that because they're brittle, they would fracture. And we found that um, with specially treated ceramics that they don't actually fracture at a high rate but also are very smooth and lead to less wear of the plastic bearing surface that is in most joints. Now, there's a process called oxidation that happens inside the human body. Um, that It's the same process that happens on an iron uh, fence post, right? Rust. So that same chemical process can happen to the plastic joint surfaces that are used in joint replacements. And one of the ways by which we've found that when that oxidative process happens, it decreases the wear characteristics and the wear properties of the plastic. So they, they degrade at a faster rate. And so one of the challenges in orthopedics was to figure out how to retard that process or stop it. And what we found is that using various techniques that actually incorporating antioxidants into the material of the plastic, specifically vitamin E, um, we've, we've used vitamin E that's been incorporated into our plastics to, to arrest that quote unquote rust process. And so that also leads to better longevity of these implants. Lots of the marketing research and lots of the marketing that these companies do, they'll throw out numbers like this joint will last you for 35 years, those kind of things. However, I would say that it, once you've had a joint replacement, that you're entering into a relationship for life with your surgeon. Your surgeon's job beyond just doing your joint replacement is to monitor your joint replacement for life. 
The reason being is that oftentimes we can find a problem that could arise before you ever have a symptom. And the fixes oftentimes in that setting are very fast. And the recovery process for any surgery associated with that is very fast. However, when, we, when you begin to have symptoms and then start to look, oftentimes things need to be a little bit more involved. Well, that's going to do it today. Doctor, thank you very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Kwame Ennen is joining us today, and we appreciate that. Texas Health is partnering with you for a better North Texas. To hear more Wellbeing DFW podcasts, visit our website at texashealth.org slash podcast. I'm Scott Sams. Thanks for being with us.